Hello and welcome. My name is the Reverend Andy Bowden. I'm the vicar of St Andrew's Church in Buckler Monocorum and the Church of the Holy Spirit in Milton Coombe. Whether you are a regular member of our church family, whether you have been following us through these series of lockdowns and online services, whether this is your very first time with us, you're all very, very welcome. And we are delighted that you are here with us today. We are continuing our new series this morning. Last week we kicked off with Hebrews chapter 1. And as we explore this incredible book of the Bible, we'll be finding out more about God's unshakable kingdom and the king who is beyond compare. This morning, our associate minister, the Reverend Andy Farmer, will be speaking to us from Hebrews chapter 2. But as we begin our time together now, let's do so with some opening responses. And if you'd like to, join in with the words in bold type. Let's begin together. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Your light springs up for the righteous, and all the peoples have seen your glory. Please do join with me in saying these wonderful words from Psalm 100. We say together, O be joyful in the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious. His steadfast love is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Although those words are ancient, they are so poignant for us today, encouraging us to enter God's courts with thanksgiving and praise. Well, we're going to do that in our first hymn together. It might be that you'd like to stand to sing. Uh, perhaps you're more comfortable sitting uh, and enjoying the music and the words. You might want to uh, drum your fingers along on the kitchen table or tap your feet in your living room. But let's Praise God together now in the words of this incredible hymn. The opening lines are from Philippians chapter 2 and remind us that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Oh 
just a moment, we're going to have our Bible reading and then Andy is going to speak to us. But before that, we're going to prepare our hearts by coming to God and confessing our sins, saying sorry to him and recognising the way in which we haven't lived with him as God of our lives. So if you'd like to, I'd encourage you to join in with the words of the prayer in bold type as we pray to God together. Let us return to the Lord, our God, and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son, and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Well, I do hope you have your Bibles handy at home. Uh, I'm going to pass over now to Debbie for our reading. Thank you, Debbie. Today's reading is from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 18. Jesus made like his brothers. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honour, and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted He is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It is really good to be with you. Uh, Thank you for taking the time out to listen to our service uh, and participate in our worship today. Uh, It is really encouraging to to know that so many people have found our channel and uh, we just really thank you for taking that time out. So for today, um, we will be looking at Jesus made fully human and and, and particularly studying Hebrews in continuation. We'll be looking at chapter two, verses five to the end. And just before we start, let's uh, just just bow our heads uh, and just have some short time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your scripture. We thank you for the writer of Hebrews. We ask that through your spirit, we hear what you're saying to us today, making it live in our hearts and in our minds. 
And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were fully human and fully God. That you loved us so much, you stepped down from heaven to become like one of us. Help us to understand what that means as we study the scripture together. For the glory of your name. Amen. So I'm not sure what sort of week you guys have had. Um, I guess it's our third lockdown now. Some of us maybe get a little fatigued. Um, and I suppose it's in my nature, in my character really. One of the things I like to do is um, to do sometimes do things uh, slightly differently. And, and I've been looking at the way, particularly from the day job point of view, um, that I've been interfacing on, on Zoom and on Teams, which is a, a, a similar sort of product. And one of the things I noticed was that um, it was crackling when I was speaking. Um, and with a little bit of investigation, I found out that my microphone wasn't working properly. So um, I then uh, Googled it, as, as so many of us do, I'm sure, when we have a problem. Uh, after switching it on and off more than once, which is what we also do with IT when we have a problem. And came to the conclusion that I probably needed to fit a new microphone. So that's what I've done. So hopefully this week you can hear a very clear voice from me. But it wasn't as straightforward as I make out. Um, in a sense, it became quite difficult because to fit the new microphone, I had to fit a new camera. And one of the difficulties is, is that previously the camera was in one position, which made it very easy to look at the camera and hence the people the other side of the lens and still have a, an eye on uh, some notes and a presentation or whatever else I was sharing. But that's been really difficult because the camera position has moved. And it would be very easy for me to be reading my notes down here or across there, or maybe looking this way. And as a result of which, I'm not focused and giving my attention uh, to the people who are listening. And I think it's really important um, that we hang on to that message what are we looking at? What are we focusing on? What has our attention? I remember uh, Parish Camp Beach at Blackpool Sands, many of you will remember, the crashing waves for a couple of metres at the front end um, that throws you onto the, uh, the pebbled, uh, shingled beach. But if you swim out a couple of metres, um, it's quite calm. Uh, and the beauty of that is, of course, is that you can float in the water, maybe have a little chat with friends you haven't seen for a while, uh, relax and just enjoy the scenery. But then you look back towards the beach and suddenly realise that you're probably 20 or 30 metres further up from where you started. And there's been that sense of drift. So there's that current that sort of moves you away from what you were focusing on. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that's just something we want to hold in the back of our minds today. What do we focus on? And when and how do we drift away from it? So we continue with our readings within Hebrews. And in particular, uh, this is addressing a new group of Christians. And in particular, it's looking at the context of Jesus against their historical Jewish faith. So, for example, we see quotations from the Psalms, quotations from Isaiah and other parts of Scripture that they will be very familiar with. So what we're going to do today is just to consider two or three things, really. And whilst we're looking at the humanity of Jesus, the writer of Hebrews looks at this in three distinct ways. One is uh, the very much the importance of humanity to God. God created humans and they are very, very important to him. And then the writer goes on to talk a little bit about, well, why was Jesus fully human? And then he moves on to talk about, well, if Jesus is fully human, what does it mean to the believers? In this case, the people of uh, the new Christians, the, new, the, the Hebrew people he was talking to. But actually, there's some things there that we need to pick up on. That will resonate with us today. And like so many of these chapters within Hebrews, there is so much, it is so much information in there that you have to leave some things on the table. So my health warning today is 
that whilst we are looking at Jesus being fully human, he is and was fully God. And whilst I might not be mentioning that on every slide, please, please remember that Jesus is fully God. So whilst we talk about him being fully human, he is very, very much fully God as well. So how do we know that Jesus existed? Uh, and for those of us who know Jesus and um, read and study the Bible, then uh, we are drawn to verses like John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But also if we look at some of the history, um, I, I think I'm, I'm Andy mentioned this last week, that all reputable scholars of, of antiquity and of history would agree that Jesus existed. So Jesus, the man, definitely existed. And there are two events that are supported uh, probably universally by scholarly consensus. And they are that Jesus was baptised by John the Baptist and he was crucified by the, or the, the Roman prefect uh, Pontius Pilate. And if we look at sources outside of the Bible, then the uh, sort of earliest reference is by a historian called Thalos, which was about 55 uh, AD. And also, uh, some of you may have heard of the historian Josephus, and he too wrote about Jesus. Um, and, and I think it's worth remembering as well, is, is, is that when um, historians look at um, the credibility of documents, then they look at, amongst other things, two very important things. One is, how close was the document written to the event? And secondly, how many original copies are there? And it's really encouraging and reassuring for us to be able to say to non-Christians, well, actually, the Bible fulfills both those criteria at a very significantly higher level than most other documents that have survived from that time. And as Christians, of course, we have the evidence of the Bible to say that Jesus was fully human. The reading from John, Jesus being in the wilderness and being tempted by Satan. We read as well in Luke's Gospel that uh, he grew up. In John's Gospel that he was tired, he got thirsty. In Matthew's Gospel he became weak, he prayed to his father. And then in both Luke and John's Gospel that he had a human body that was recognisable after the resurrection. Jesus was fully human. I mentioned earlier about um, the technique that the writer of Hebrews uses to, um, to link the things that he is writing um, to, his, to his audience, in this case the, the new Christians, the Hebrews. And what he does is to, to look for pieces of scripture. And what we pick up in this reading in verses 6, 7 and 8 is actually a direct copy of the words in Psalm 8. So I will read the words from Psalm 8 to you, and perhaps if you have a Bible in front of you, um, then you can compare them with what's seen in Hebrews. Or if you haven't got a Bible, please feel free to pause, uh, dash, get one, and then come back again uh, and follow it as appropriate. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. Now the uh, audience that this was written for originally would have put angels as um, very high in terms of the hierarchy because they believed that the angels received the law uh, and shared that. It also, in these words, emphasises the importance of humanity to the Creator. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? God created mankind. God created mankind to be in relationship with him. And God appointed mankind as being stewards. 
despite being unworthy, he gave us the responsibility of stewardship. And when we read in the, in the words as well, um, this phrase, son of man, uh, we sometimes in the New Testament would reflect that as being Jesus. But in the Old Testament, we can go back to Daniel and son of man meant a human being as well. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. I think I could probably just about do a message on this one verse. So I'm just going to pause and if you have a Bible in front of you, let you read it again. This one verse describes the gospel message. These three, four, five lines describe the gospel message. Who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Jesus was made man. The incarnation of Christ. Because he suffered death, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus died as a propitiation for our sins. Jesus paid the sacrifice for the sins that he had not committed because he loved us so much. Now crowned with glory and honour, Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father. So that by the grace of God this happened. And the verse begins with, but we do see Jesus. So in this one verse, these short three, four, five lines, we read about the incarnation of Christ, Jesus being made man. We read about his death, suffering on the cross as a sacrifice for us. We read about his resurrection and ascension, crowned with glory and honour, and all done by the grace of God for us the unworthy. And the call is very simply this, that we do see Jesus. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. I mean, isn't that incredible? The pioneer of their salvation. Not by chance, not by a series of accidental events but the pioneer of their salvation. Jesus is the one who makes people holy and they are made holy and they are part of the same family. And isn't it incredible? I mean, the writer here in Hebrews who's talking to, um, to this audience and it still applies to us today. Isn't it incredible? Jesus, who was at the formation, the creation, the foundation of everything. Jesus, who is fully God, will call us his brothers and sisters. He is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Sons and daughters. How incredible is that? We are God's children, sons and daughters, heirs with Jesus. One family. Jesus shared in the humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him, him who holds the power of death, that is the devil.
Jesus broke the power of death. He suffered so that we may not suffer in the long term. He freed us by his death from the slavery of sin and the fear of death. This is how much he loved us. He suffered, he died, he sacrificed his own life so that we may know no fear. That our relationship with God can be restored and we can live our lives with such great hope. The writer of Hebrews puts fully human in every way, not just a little bit human, not just a really good understanding of what it was like to be human, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he may make atonement for the sins of the people. Merciful and faithful high priest. Our faithful high priest. Encouraging us to serve God and honour his name. Knowing that we have hope because our sins have been paid for by the death of Jesus on the cross. Fully human in every way. But if that's not enough, it doesn't end there. The writer goes on to say that Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted. And we know that he suffered on the cross. And it is because of this that he's able to help those who are being tempted and those who suffer. We remember back to Jesus in the wilderness at the very beginning of his um, message and serving and ministry. He first went into the wilderness and was tempted three times by the devil. But he resisted. So Jesus, as we know, has no sin and that's why he could pay the price on the cross. But that doesn't mean he wasn't tempted. Jesus is not a distant God, far off an example that we could never achieve. But Jesus is in relationship with us through his spirit. And because he has suffered, he can share in our suffering. The writer of Hebrews was at pains to point out that Jesus was fully human in every way. And that his death broke the power of death. His death on the cross was an atonement, a price to be paid for the sins of the people because he loved us so much. And Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest and above all is now crowned with glory and honour. So how do we respond to this? This example that Jesus has given us, this selfless example that he's given by laying down his life. How do we respond to this? He is a merciful and faithful high priest, crowned in glory and honour. Picking up my original point around drift, whether it's which piece of the camera do we look at, what part of the screen, or maybe floating in the sea of life and drifting away and not realising how far we've drifted from Jesus. But we do see Jesus. We see Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Now crowned with glory and honour, because he suffered death, 
so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were fully human. We thank you that for us, you selflessly suffered, were tempted. That for us, you lay down your life as an atonement for our sins. And now you have risen and are sitting in glory. Thank you for the relationship we have from you. Thank you that we are loved first and our response is to love you. Please encourage us this week to focus on you, Lord Jesus, not to drift away, but to think of the scriptures and what they say about you and what the Spirit prompts us to do in our hearts. And we ask these things so that your name may be glorified. Amen. I'm sure there's lots for us to ponder from Andy's sermon, lots for us to pray through. And we're going to have a time now to respond together. We're going to have two songs, the first of which is an instrumental. You might like to just enjoy the music and pray through things that have struck you from this morning. You might want to join in and sing. Please do what is right for you. And after that, we're going to sing another great song that reminds us that Jesus is the hope for the nations.
Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light. Let us pray. I will end each section with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and the response, hear our prayer. Loving Father, as we come to you in prayer today, turn each one of us to yourself, that we might see more clearly what our lives ought to be like, and strengthen us to live as children of the light, that we may go on our way pardoned and renewed for Jesus' sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation and for our leaders and all who are involved in making decisions on our behalf. We give thanks for any encouraging news that we hear about the fight against the pandemic. We pray for all who are hurting because of sickness and loss of a loved one and who are suffering emotionally and financially in these times. We give thanks for all who are working to relieve suffering in whatever their role and we pray for their protection. 
We pray for the Queen and we give thanks for her strong Christian faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all Christian leaders and we pray for our bishops, Robert, Jackie and Nick. And we pray for Andy Bowden and Andy Farmer as they lead us in the parish at this challenging time. We give thanks for their servant hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for St Andrew's School. We give thanks and pray for the head teacher, Sarah Lacey. We pray for resilience for those families who are teaching at home. And we pray for safety for the staff and students who are attending the school every day. We pray for all those who are worried and anxious and we pray for unity at this difficult time amongst the staff, students, parents and governors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our mission partners, especially the Dillingham family in Chad with MAF. We pray for protection for Becky as she flies around the country and lands at remote airstrips. We pray for good health for all of the family, Becky, Matt, Bethan and Luke. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are sick and in need. And we pray for all who look after those who are unwell, especially those living in our local area. Loving Father, give to all those who look after the sick skill, understanding and compassion, and enable them to do their work in dependence on your grace and for your glory. I will end with these words. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Philip, thank you so much for your prayers. As we come towards the end of our time together, I'd like to just draw one or two items to your attention, perhaps mention one or two dates for your diary. The first event I'd like to flag up is actually taking place this evening. There is a uh, service for Christian unity that has been organised by the TACT group, the Tavistock Area Christians Together. And this evening at six o'clock via Zoom, there will be uh, a service to which everyone is warmly invited. They have asked that we bring a candle with us, so do uh, be prepared for that. If you'd like to be involved and haven't yet received information, please do give me a call or uh, get in touch with me via email and I'd be delighted to share that Zoom information with you. Looking a little further ahead, our next central prayer meeting is on February the 3rd at 8 o'clock. Uh, again, that is an event via Zoom, and if you need information, please do get in touch. Uh, prayer is so vital for our work and life as Christians, and so we want to be covering everything that we do as a church in prayer, praying for our mission partners, our own outreach here, uh, our ongoing work, and uh, for one another as well. So please do uh, put that date in your diary. Be there at eight o'clock, whether you're someone who's used to praying out loud or not. Uh, we'd love to have you with us. Looking further ahead again, our next Christianity Explore course begins in a couple of weeks' time. On Thursday, the 11th of February, we'll be kicking off the seven-week course that gives us an opportunity to explore the claims of Christ in the Gospel of Mark. If you'd like to uh, come along just to brush up on your basics, uh, or perhaps there's uh, someone you could invite, then please do get in touch at the email address at the bottom of the notice. It is a, a great informal course, a chance to ask lots of questions, and uh, we look forward to seeing a good number there in the weeks ahead. Well, as we close now, we're going to do so with a final piece of music, a blessing for us all as we look forward to the rest of the week 
in the knowledge that Jesus is King and that we are called to follow him. So may God bless you. May God be with you. Amen.